Hello. All right. I'm not going to lie, this is pretty weird. I'm standing in a club. <laughs> um, hope everyone's doing doing good. Uh, so yeah, I'm I'm Eric. Uh, I perform under the name Cocktail Party Effect, and uh, been asked by the uh, eclectic people to show some tips and tricks in Ableton, um, and just sort of things I like to do when I'm making tunes, really. Um, so the initial thing we're going to talk about is feedback. Um, and feedback's a really interesting thing because it can be used in like really interesting ways, especially with drums. Um, those of you who are like familiar with like analog mixers, you can use feedback in a really interesting way. And the idea is basically you take an audio output and then you put it back into an audio input. And what happens is the signal just goes round and round and round and causes like a big, big wall of noise. Um, and what we're going to sort of do is do this in Ableton and hopefully show you some ways you can use it to make some interesting uh, drum patterns and drones and all this kind of thing. So the initial idea about causing feedback is you have to send a signal to itself. Now, before I kind of get into it, I'll give you an example of what feedback, a feedback loop kind of sounds like, which is if I go and grab the uh, echo in Ableton, which is a, a delay unit. Now, if you're familiar with like most delays, they'll always have like a feedback setting, which basically means that it will just continue and continue. And this echo in particular, it works more like this sort of like a, a tape dub echo, really. So if I kind of make a sound, you can hear it going off. And then as I put up the feedback, distorted and all this kind of stuff. Um, it's a really nice thing to play around with because obviously you can make some crazy sounds, ex like an you know, example like this. <laughs> kind of like a, your own take on a police siren. Um, and basically, you can do this effect using return channels in Ableton and you kind of get a different kind of sound to that. You get a much more sort of digital, harsh noise. So what we're going to do is build one from scratch just to show you what I'm talking about. So what you need, I feel like I'm in Art Attack. So, <laughs> you know, here's one I made earlier. Um, so you get your loop, basically, and what we're going to do is make a completely new return channel. Uh, nothing on it. And what you're going to need to do this, so a word of warning, this gets really loud and uh, it can cause damage to your speakers and hearing if you're not careful. So I recommend doing this at a really low volume. Also making sure you follow these instructions because uh, I've done it a few times <laughs> and uh, it's not a nice thing to happen. So what you need is, is a return channel and grab yourself a limiter. Now this will always be at the end of the chain, at the end of the effects chain. Uh, you'll see why, in a minute, why this is so important. Now, this basically will be here, and then we're going to basically make a standard dub echo. So we'll get a delay and a distortion. And what will happen now is if I send this drum beat to it, it will sound like this. thing is, it's not kind of rising and building and building. So what we need to do is we actually need to activate the return channel to itself. So down here, you always get these grayed out blocks. So if you right click on it, oh, ah, why are you not letting me do this? <laughs> OK, let's go around then. There we go. Enable send. So now it's activated. So. What will happen now is if I do exactly the same thing. And I stop the beat and start turning up the center itself. So that's 
start getting this really digital gnarly feedback, which is definitely a taste thing. Um, but <laughs> it can be quite cool because, you know, once you start messing around with it, so... interesting tones. Now, going to this limiter, right, the reason why this is so important, if I take this limiter off and I do this, it will jump straight up into the red and basically uh, it's horrible. So always remember the limiter at the end. The interesting thing about this is when you're messing about with it and you're messing with the overdrive and the uh, timing of the delay, you, because, you know, you're causing basically this digital feedback, anything you sort of mess with will affect this feedback and act in a really interesting way. Example like this. So you can hear it's like changing tone and getting kind of really wacky results. And the more you kind of mess with, you know, things like the overdrive placement, so I've got it right in the sort of low frequency area. You notice know, these kind of rhythms start coming out of it. So the kick drum starts pushing through with feedback. So you kind of get these like rhythmical, makes this really fun is when you start putting things in between the effects so example being um, anything you put in there now is going to cause a kind of uh, a chain of weirdness so I've got frequency shifter erosion <laughs> So it could be quite cool for just textual ideas. Um, the, the thing that makes it really fun as well is like the stuff you start putting in there. So different frequency range, like drum kits and loops, uh, even melodies and stuff, it acts completely different. So I've got a couple of examples here. There we go. So this one here is like a little chain. So as you can see, the, the limiter always at the end. Do remember that. Um, you don't want tinnitus at the moment, or actually ever. So there it is, it's, it's going off, and then I start putting up the volume, so it's going back into itself. Now, what you might have noticed at the beginning, I've got an EQ. Turn that up a little bit. So this is where the feedback world gets really interesting because basically the EQ can act almost like controlling a synthesizer. It's quite strange. So here's an example. If I go back to my original little, uh, little feedback loop here and I'm going to put an EQ. It's now going to go, as I move the EQ around, so this, linked with all this stuff, becomes really cool, because again, 
Imagine, like, so the, the big problem is, of course, you can hear just loads of bass, and this might become a problem when you're actually getting to the mix down stage of your tune. So, we'll get to that in a second how we sort that out. Because the problem is, you can't just put an EQ at the end because it is a feedback loop, so it will just you'll just change the sound. I've got another little beat here, very minimal, and here I've got a another chain that I've built, and yeah, this is how it sounds. Still putting on the feedback. So you can hear suddenly that groove. Pretty empty and just sort of gives nothing. Suddenly has a bit more uh, edge to it. And the cool thing is, you keep experimenting, so it shouldn't still like delay. And if you keep messing around, so it's pretty nice because the results you get from it yeah are always unexpected and something like I really like about finding tricks like this is I mean, it's just kind of how I like to work, but I'm, I really like not knowing what I'm doing with these things, especially when you're in the creative process and like letting the computer, as I've always said about instruments and stuff, it's, it's not you telling it what to do, it's a, it's a collaboration. So nothing nicer than when you sort of feed things into like, you know, a sequence like this and then it gives you back influence and then you're like, you know, excited to carry on, you know, making a tune. Um, so let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. Um, is, is a chain again I've made? There's a question. Should you do questions now or later? Okay. Hold all questions till the end, please. Um, <laughs> so here I've got a chain I've made. And so those of you who are stuck at home, Here's something you can do which really passes the time, which is basically getting loads of LFOs and like putting it to the uh, EQ and just watching it go magically round like this. Um, it's a beautiful thing. So what I've got here is an EQ doing its own thing. Got a delay, saturator, overdrive, limiter, always at the end. And a bunch of LFOs, which are probably going to crash my project, um, controlling, just controlling the EQ settings, basically. So all together, when you put this through, so I've got this kick through, and then feedback in it. Sorry headphones users, this is uh, pretty gnarly. But then playing with the kick. start messing around with the settings of it. And to me, it's just really fun because, yeah, the results are always just mental. And it's like consistently giving you ideas. Um, which is really nice. So lastly, I've got another chain 
and this again we're just all getting more and more stupid really um <laughs> so again loads loads of lfos um to different things auto pan just to give it a little bit of left and right and again limiter at the end i'm going to keep repeating that because it's mate it's horrible if you forget that saturator delays a couple of delays and frequency shifter and a nice moving EQ. Um, and this one is a chain I use quite often, which sounds like this. So that's just on its own, about the drums. So yeah, feedback, it's, it's wicked. It's a real nice world to get into. Um, it's like the gift that keeps giving really. The fun thing as well is, you know, the opportunities to just to create loads of just samples for yourself. Um, so I'm gonna get into the next part of this, which is like, how do we use this actually in a track regarding, so you've made your feedback, um, sounds good or horrible depends <laughs> depends what you want um and you know you, you've got it but the problem is obviously we're pushing around bass frequencies we're pushing around high end and it's just a bit gnarly um so how do we fix this now what you want to do is you want to get yourself an audio channel and what you want to do is route it to one of the return channels. So what we're gonna do is record what's going on in the return channel. So if I go back to my little beat here, send this now to the uh, to C. So that's gonna start working. And we're gonna feedback it. And what we can see is it's coming through. And now we're gonna let it go. The best thing to do is just leave it. Leave it for a while. Go for a walk. Go, go play a game of chess. Go for a jog. Not today. <laughs> Let it just do its thing. You can take that off. And all of a sudden now we've got samplage for days. So it's now all here, and we can put that under the drums. And of course, here we've got an EQ, so I can take out any nasty frequencies. You know, one real fun thing to do with this as well, if we're using the drums, you can always reverse it. Um, little tip as well, what's really cool about feedback is, you know, you can always put it into Wavetable or, you know, even you could use Sampler, for instance. Um, and this is always a real nice thing because when you have it in there, you now have a kind of a new, a new synthesizer to play with. And of course, you could start messing about with this. So one little trick that's really nice is use the oscillator section in the uh, sampler. Just endless, endless noise.
Endless noise. Um, got any questions? Do you think it would be possible to calibrate the EQ with some things like C, uh, CV tools, GCO pitch calibration tools? Possibly. You know what? I'm going to have to give you a proper cop out answer to that one and say I don't quite know. <laughs> I'm not a big, um, I haven't sort of messed with that. I, uh, one thing you could do with it, which is pretty interesting, is using it as an audio rate modulation source. So for instance, if you send it out into some hardware, for instance, like a modular oscillator or something into the pitch and all this kind of thing, you can use it in an interesting way there. But um, no, I, I don't quite know about that one. Um, quite a basic person, <laughs> these things. <laughs> um, any other questions? Uh, sorry to disappoint you, whoever you are. Um, so, if you really want to go mental, <laughs> if you really want to, um, you can always actually send that back into the feedback chain. Now we've got double feedback going. You can always record that and just get layers and layers and layers going. Um, one other thing as well to note, you know, what's really cool about all this feedback is like the sort of frequency possibilities you get. You can make anything from it. So example being like hi-hats. So putting the transients on and then basically you can set that to six deeps. We suddenly got some like kind of interesting hi-hat patterns going. You can sort of uh, mess with them a bit, make them yeah, 32 to 6 deeps. And you could always try it with your uh, kicks to see if it works. So it's like, yeah, it just gives you a lot of stuff to work with. Um, you can try it with pads as well. It's quite interesting because, you know, when you say put in like a low bass tone or something like that, you can get some really strange results as well. I mean, example being here, I've got this. Uh, little, uh, sample from Splice and I send that through. And do the same thing. And what I'm doing is sort of generating this like undertone. And the really nice thing about using the EQ is you can boost the frequency so you know it's patching so you can get that. Feedback to work perfectly So yeah, pretty, pretty fun. Uh, if there's no other questions. Do you, do you use feedback just for drums or also something else? Man, I use it for anything. Um, you know, because drum, drums work really nicely because you're dealing with like different frequencies. So, you know, you've got your lows, like uh, mids and highs, you know, like toms, kicks and snares and hats. Um, you can use it for other stuff. I mean, one example is if you get, say, like operator up and do, 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 and I will just quickly learn how to use the push. <laughs> Let's go to harmonic minor, square mode, and then layout. Oh, no, there you go. Cool. 
So, you know, if I'm using push and I'm going to sort of make like a and then you start throwing things like this into it. sort of surprised what works. Uh, there we go, we'll just turn it off because that sounds horrendous. Um, you know, like for instance, there's sort of no uh, limit with it really because, you know, one little thing you could do, which is something um, really fun actually, is if you use, so let's get this going. So I've got that back on my drums. Always use a gate. And what you can do is side chain that gate to, you know, um, let's say we get these hi hats, right? Put that in there. And we could side chain the gate to the hi hats. What's that? I think it's that one, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. And we can actually have that going. <laughs> So now we're getting like cool rhythmical content to work with. It's a bit more like placed, it doesn't just go all over the whole thing. So now, you know, it, has, it makes much more sense. <laughs> um, so, you know, using it. You know, other than drums, for instance, vocals can be quite interesting. If you get a vocal and then, you know, uh, say someone with a low voice or something, you can throw that in and that causes some interesting effect. Um, it's a proper, like, sit down of a cup of tea and just throw whatever you want at it and just see what happens. Because, like, even to this day, there's things that, like, surprise me about it and, you know, I just didn't realise that would happen or whatever. Um, and it's the same with like an analog mixer, you know, with an analog mixer, you know, you can take, say, the headphone out of the analog mixer, back into a channel, feedback it, put drums through it, you know, you get a totally different sound. Um, in the analog world, it's kind of, it's quite addictive because every mixer has its own sound. So it's like, you know, you end up just having hundreds of mixers at home just for feedback. Um, you know, it's, it's a healthy addiction. Um, cool, any other questions? Sweet. Uh, so, if there's no questions, I'll move on to the next thing, which is uh, about resampling. Uh, we all like a bit of resampling. And this is going to go into like, conjunction with the feedback stuff as well, because you can use this for anything. And uh, I've made tracks, just like whole tracks, just out of doing this. Uh, and it's something that's like when you do it, like the process, you look like a mad person. You just, you're just like, <laughs> like flicking the mouse about and it goes completely mental. Um, now, what we're going to do is, I've got the same loop as over here. And what we're going to do is record the master channel. Now, this is sort of 
something you might know if you just press the resampling button. What this does, it will just basically pick up the master channel and if I press the record, you can see it's all coming through. So basically, if I press record, you'll see it now come up. Amazing. Right, so, which is, you know, pretty useful for things like, you know, reverse reverb effects and all this kind of thing um, and other things you want to do. Now, what we're going to do is try and make this, we're going to try and make this danceable beat completely undanceable. Um, and you know, think of it as a challenge. And what we're going to do is get the sample. Here's the sort of warp mode. You want to select repitch. Uh, what repitch will do is it'll act like a sort of vinyl player. So when you go up in speed with the BPM, it'll get faster, you know, and also um, higher in pitch. If you go down, it'll get lower in pitch and slower. And what we're going to do is this: arm the track, it's in resample mode, press record, and what we're going to do is flick the tempo up and down as it's recording. So it's easier with a mouse. Um, of course, that sounds completely off the wall. And the problem is, obviously, it will record what you're doing with the automation here. So do make a note of what tune, you know, what your BPM was when you were making your tune, because I don't know if you were making it at 627 BPM. Um, you know, it's the new 120. Um, however, for this example, not so. Now, if I go back to say 132, I think it was. Here's the cool thing: as it records, um, basically it'll be warped, and this is kind of what's weird. Is able to basically tries to make it uh, make some sense, which ends up sounding like this. What's really nice about this is you can flick through the different warp modes, right? So you can go to textures. Get loads of different stuff going. And the beautiful thing about this is when you're messing about with this beat, so here it is the original. Suddenly we've got all these different rhythms. So little things like that, you can pick that out. You know, and then you can sort of mess around with the transpose again. And it's wicked because, yeah, it's just, again, the gift that keeps going. Like, you can just... And you can find other little bits you like. get loads of cool sounds from it. Um, the fun thing as well, you can just keep going with this as well. And this is something, um, I have this philosophy about loops and all this that, you know, don't, don't throw it away. You know, if you, if you keep resampling things and, you know, letting it do its thing and don't, don't you know, if you kind of get to this point where it's like, oh, I don't know even what this sounds like anymore. Don't throw it away, just keep, keep mangling it because eventually something could come out of it. So, you know, you can take that beat, again, repitch, do exactly the same thing. There we go, great. And we've got an even more weirder loop of what we did before. Again, 160, oh no, 680 BPM. Go back up, let's delete this automation. Let's have a listen.
And the really nice thing about this is the transients here, you can always put this down. And get loads of percussive hits from it as well. But wait, there's more. So knowing that you can do this with you know, a drum loop, What's really fun is when you just put the whole track in there and do it. Um, so you can basically, you know, you, you make your tune, and then you resample it by just doing what we just did, the whole tune in resample, and then you have tons of drum fills you can use. So here's a little loop I made, and we're going to do exactly that. So. Highlight everything, make sure it's in re-pitch. Great. And then let's record and destroy it. Great. Uh, so that's now recorded. Delete the automation, go down. And let's, let's have a listen to uh, how this sounds. So there, right there. snippet here. You know, you're getting like these really strange sort of artifacts in there. And this is the thing about software that I really like because, you know, um, the sort of classic argument, you know, what's better, you know, hardware and software? Well, this is the thing, they're both great because they give you these results that are like you know, completely different. You know, analog has its character and software has its character. And like one of the things I was real, always really into when I was sort of first started using software um, was like, how can you, how can you break it? How can you just uh, keep throwing stuff at it and really kind of get the character of what you're using out of it? And um, yeah, my first laptop was this PC and uh, it used to crash after like 30 minutes and even less. So I only had like 20, 30 minutes to make a tune. And uh, it was this copy of Reason I had and I used to just love like just patching things wherever and just seeing what chaos I could could and then I'd like do out of it and then I'd bounce it down, put it on the desktop <laughs> and then the computer would restart, put it back in. Um, you know, so the possibilities are endless with this. You can also unwarp it as well if you want to. So you can have a listen to the complete mess you made. And there's loads of like nice little hits you can use out of it. So putting everything together that we've done, what I'm gonna do now is I'm going to mute this track and then I'm going to send this to one of my modulated feedback noises. I think this is the right one. I'm getting a bit lost. Uh, one, two, three. One, two, three. There it is. And I'm going to resample it with the feedback. now going to be on there and again you could just go mental you could even stretch even lower find loads of interesting artifacts in there the 
thing is, it's like, as chaos as it sounds, and of course, you know, it's not Beethoven, <laughs> but <laughs> you're going you're gonna to sort of find something eventually. Like, and yeah, it's uh, one real nice thing about working this way is, you know, if you just keep hacking at it and you just keep resampling, twisting, resampling, twisting, eventually, I guarantee you're going to get like a, re like a eureka moment where you're just like wicked. Um, also, a little trick as well, those of you who like to stretch everything to uh, oblivion. If you've got your sample and let's say you have a bit of a problem, because when you stretch in Ableton, there's only a limit. There's a little nice way you can get around this. If you unwarp it, transpose, command J, that's going to consolidate it. And uh, now this should take up for the next two hours of the class, which is cool. So we'll just sit here in silence. <laughs> no, we're not doing that. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> the panic, the panic over there. No, um, that's going to take a long time. But what you can do is consolidate, put it back up, consolidate, put it back up, and you will just keep getting this forever stretched um, chaos out of it, which, you know, I think that's the fun thing as well. Even though it takes ages, the results can be quite worth it after a while. Um, it's quite nice when you just, you know, especially if you're like lost for inspiration, you know, you could just, I mean, I do that a lot. Like if I don't want to write a track, I just, everything I write, I feel like sounds crap. I'll just stretch something to oblivion and just see what happens. And then you've just got hours of stuff you can use. Um, you can experiment with other things as well. I mean, yeah, another thing you could always do is, you know, using things like sampler. Always try a sampler out. You know, and you can make pads out of anything. Putting that through for complex on, get some attack going, and some release. So yeah, it's pretty cool because you've got all you need really there. Um, any other questions? Because I think I'm coming to the near the end of my, uh, of my talk. <laughs> no. So just a little bit of philosophy on this. Um, it's really good practice to try and make a track out of like the most minimal resources, like with samples. Try and utilize every function in a software to do this. Um, because if you, if you take a drum loop, so like what we were just sort of doing with, uh, you know, with the feedback and stuff, you take a drum loop, put the feedback in, record it, make those hi-hats, you know, put it into sample and make some pads. You kind of find there's like some, one, you will learn the software really quickly because you're sort of utilizing every little, little thing about it. Also your track, to me anyway, personally, it always has like a familiarity like throughout it because you're always kind of using these consistent, you know, harmonic spaces for it. And one of the worst things I always find to do for me personally, when I'm making tunes, is basically just keep adding more and more samples from like my folder. Um, you're just you're just inviting too many people to the party, basically. So uh, then it just gets messy, you know. It's uh, <laughs> I mean that's the analogy, you know. If you have like four mates over for a cup of tea and a chat, and then you start inviting the neighbour and everyone down the street, it's going to become chaos, and then suddenly you've got a massive mess in your house you've got to clean up. So when you restrict yourself to just very basic steps like that and use things like resampling and all this, even though you're not going to get like your traditional hi-hat, you still will get 
something of interesting character. And yeah, you know, it's, it's a long process just for a hi-hat or a snare or a pad, but you know, you will learn a lot out of that as well. You will uh, find some very interesting sounds along the way that actually might influence you for different tracks and all this kind of thing. Uh, that's about it. No oh, question? Yeah. Um, how did you stretch the warp sample? Uh, that's a very basic question. No, 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 it's all good, it's all good. Um, yeah, stretching warp samples, basically, when you have a sample, let's say, like this drum beat again. Oh. I can't hear anything for some reason. There, it is. there we go, see? Rookie mistake from me as well. <laughs> <laughs> leaving something on solo. Um, so, you know, when you stretch a sample down here, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I can try and make it go big. Oh, I don't know, if, there we go, wee. Um, down here you have these functions, which is like these stretch modes. And above it, you've got this, uh, this two and this other two. One's got a star and one's got two dots next to it. One will double time it, so it make it faster. And then one will half time it. So you'll get stretched sounds like this. And of course, you can just stretch it out to oblivion. Um, and different, different stretch modes will have different characters. So, you know, if you want the texture kind of thing, which is one of my favorites, because again, you get really strange artifacts out of it. you know, to sort of mess about with it. One real nice tip actually with this, uh, not to go away from your question, but hopefully that answers your question, that's how you do it. Um, you use these buttons here and then you can stretch and mess with it. Um, one thing in Ableton I personally can never find, if anyone can, <laughs> let me know. You can't seem to automate grain size. So again, real nice tip for that is to resample it. Um, Make a tra track, select resampling, it'll go through. And this is always something really fun to mess about with. And again, you have loads of samplage there you can mess with. But yeah. So that's how you stretch things, and that's also how you can kind of, you know, with the parameters, record them as well. Because um, that always seems to be something I'm a bit sad that you can't quite fully do. Any other questions? Um, more of a request. If yeah. it's possible to take a screenshot of the in, out, then return from the right side, if you can't read it with the shitty video quality. Um, <laughs> maybe post it on the... Yeah, the sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll tell you what as well. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. I can also put up some screenshots of the effects chains as well. Um, one thing I'm always quite sort of, uh, you know, to the point with Ableton is always, I always like to use as many uh, Ableton stock plugins as possible so everyone can kind of recreate these things. Um, so I'll take a picture of the routing and the the effects chains as well um, all will be revealed <laughs> no that's cool um yeah so hopefully that was in some way useful um if anyone's interested i do do uh private tuition as well so you can always hit me up on uh, instagram on cocktail party effect instagram and you know um I'm always up for showing more strange things you can do in Ableton. Um, cool. And uh, stay safe and nice um, one. Oh. Do you follow a logic for loop, loop or just Oh, sorry, LFO. Do you follow a logic for LFO or just casually create a chain? Um, oh, yeah. Well, that's the thing. So I... Uh, I'm not a big fan of logic, uh, <laughs> so uh, I don't. I like to sort of just mess with these things. Now, when I'm using an LFO, 
as you can see here, you know, so usually like if I'm, you know, doing gentle effects and stuff, you know, there is a sort of method. So here's an example, it's like if I take this sound here, you know, and if I want to sort of make wavering tones, get rid of this drum bus here. And, you know, one of the things, if you want to be logical with LFOs, you know, if you want just gentle movements, then yeah, sure, because for instance, let's say with this, you know, uh, the time of the delay, you know, I want this just to be really, really gentle like that. You know, then yes. But most of the time, you know, I like a bit of random in my life. So, you know, one of the things about random, which is great again, is just this consistent, I don't know what's going to happen. You know, so I tend to sort of like to work that way first and then kind of go backwards. Um, I always say with like, when you make a track and you're making effects, uh, I like to sort of consider it the same way as um, like, uh, like when you're like messing with, I don't know, clay or something, you know, like you just want to get your hands dirty and just sort of throw stuff at it and just like, you know, make loads of noise. And then the next day being in a different headspace, then you can start going over it with a fine brush you know, and then adjusting things and making them make more sense. Um, but that's just me personally. I'm not a very, uh, like, uh, precise person. But yeah, regarding that with the LFOs, that's kind of how I like to work with them. And obviously some of the fun things with LFOs is like, you know, you can send an LFO to the rate of an LFO. Uh, and some days I will just do this forever <laughs> and ever and ever. One of the things is noting as well about those, just as a little tip, you can send these to return channels. So now the return channel will activate with the LFO. And this can be quite cool, especially with this feedback thing, because now we can actually have this go in example but it's an example nevertheless um, but yeah no LFOs are great they're, they're really good fun um, the two programs I use is Ableton and Bitwig and you know if you're a Bitwig user it's fantastic for that as well because you can just obviously the LFOs are inbuilt into the program so you can just go forever um, with that cool